Chapter 12, Hickory Dickory Dock. Friday morning, I was tired and a little jumpy because I thought Mrs. Brisbane might be upset that I mixed up her cards. I was also worried about Harry. All week long, I'd held my breath after every bell, wondering if hurry up Harry would be tardy or not. After all, he'd made a deal with Mrs. Brisbane. He did unsqueakably well at keeping his end of the bargain. But on Thursday, he had been late to school because his mom couldn't find her car keys. They were under the kitchen table. I wasn't sure whether he'd broken his end of the deal or not, so I still don't know where I'd be spending the weekend. But I forgot about everything else when Mrs. Brisbane said, Boys and girls, I'm going to announce your new classroom jobs. She explained Brisbane's buddies and how the students would work in pairs. Then she described each job. Finally, she began to read off the names of the students who would share each job. For homework collectors, Rosie and Phoebe, Mrs. Brisbane looked surprised, and I knew why. The night before, I'd moved Phoebe to do the homework job. Helpful Holly raised her hand. Don't you think I should do the job with Rosie? No, Mrs. Brisbane said. I have another job for you, Holly. Just keep listening. Holly looked disappointed. But Mrs. Brisbane continued. Animal handlers will be Joey and Kelsey. Again, Mrs. Brisbane looked surprised. I just hoped that Be Careful Kelsey would be better at taking care of the animals than she was at taking care of herself. Joey and Kelsey both looked thrilled. It really is the best job, I squeaked to Og. Boing, boing, he agreed. Door and line monitors will be Mrs. Bris will be Mrs. Brisbane paused. She obviously knew these weren't the names she'd chosen, but she read them anyway. Harry and Simon. I thought that pairing hurry up Harry with slow down Simon was a brilliant idea. At least I hope so. Mrs. Brisbane kept going. I thought maybe she'd ignore my next idea. But when she read the names, she actually looked pleased. Bulletin board designers, Paul G and Paul F. The two Pauls did not look thrilled, but I crossed my toes and hoped my ideas would work. When she got to the very end of the list, there were just two people left. These jobs just have one person, she said. Thomas, will you be class reporter? That means you have to record what we do every day in a class log, she explained. What we study, who participates, and even what the temperature is. No exaggeration, okay? Okay, Thomas said as he gave her a thumbs up. Holly, you will be the teacher's assistant. That means when I need anything done, from taking a note to the office, to answering the phone, or cleaning the board, I will ask you, do you think you can handle that? Helpful Holly did. Near the end of the day, Mrs. Brisbane made another announcement. Hurry up, Harry would be taking me home for the weekend. Yes, Harry shouted. This is my lucky day. I hoped it was my lucky day, too. I was tired from all that late night work. <laughs> Rearranging the cards, but a classroom hamster sometimes works around the clock, and I was anxious to get to hurry up Harry's house and meet his family. I had to wait a while, though, because Harry's mom was unsqueakably late in picking us up from school. Yep, I had my work cut out for me again. Harry's mom was nice, nice, nice. So was his little sister Susie. I wasn't surprised. After all, Harry was nice, nice, nice. He was all, also often late, 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 and I wanted to find out why. I got all settled on the coffee table in the, in the Edo family living room. Nice mouthy, Susie said as she leaned in close to my cage. Nice hamster, I politely corrected her. Mouth, she said, twirling in circles around my cage until I felt slightly dizzy. He's a hamster, Harry corrected her. Thank goodness. Susie twirled around again, but this time she said, Hamptha. At least, that was a little closer than mouth. Usually, when I go home with a student, I'm placed on the desk or a table, admired and played with, and then the family has dinner. 
At Harry's house, I was placed on a table, admired and played with, but dinner was a long way off. I can't say the Edo family didn't have a clock. They had a large gold one in the living room on the mantel above the fireplace, directly opposite my spot on the table. I saw the time change from 6 to 6.30 and from 6.30 to 7. Each time the clock reached the half-hour point, it chimed a lovely loud sound. Ding, 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 ding. Mommy, I'm hungry, Susie said. She stopped twirling and plopped down on the sofa. Sorry, honey, Harry's mom said. I was hoping we'd eat all eat together, but I'll go ahead and give you some pasta. Pata, 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 Susie said, jumping up and twirling around my cage again. Harry decided to wait until his dad came home, which was around 8.30. Sorry, Mr. Ito said, giving Harry's mom a kiss, which was unsqueakably nice. I was clearing up some paperwork and I lost track of time, he said. The Edos lost track of time a lot. Harry's mom said it was no problem, and it was nine when she finally said the food was ready. Susan, Susie had fallen asleep on the sofa, but the rest of the family ate together. After dinner, Harry's mom took Susie up to bed, and Harry and his dad came into the, the living room. Wow, I didn't know it was so late, Mr. Edo said, looking up at the large shiny gold clock over the fireplace. It's bedtime for you too, Harry. Oh, Dad, it's Friday night. Can I stay up a little while longer, Harry asked. Harry's dad said it was okay, especially since he had gotten home late, and he hadn't had much time with it. He hadn't had much time with his son. They started playing a game together. I decided to entertain them with some hamster acrobats. I leaped around on my tree branch and then hopped on my wheel and started spinning faster and faster. Go, Humphrey, go, Harry said, and pretty soon he and his father forgot about their game and watched me. Tomorrow we'll put him in his hamster ball, Harry told his dad. When Harry's mom came back downstairs, I started my act all over again. I was already tired from the night before, but a hamster's job is never done. Mr. Ito glanced up at the clock. Harry has a soccer game in the morning. Shh. Oh, Mrs. Ito glanced up at the clock. Harry has a soccer game in the morning, she said with a yawn. We better get to bed. Mr. Ito looked up at the clock, too. My watch is a little slow, he said, resetting it. Are you sure that clock is right? His wife asked. Very sure. It may be an antique, but it keeps perfect time, Mr. Ito answered. Mrs. Ito nodded and then adjusted her watch, too. After Harry and his parents had gone to bed, I was happy to settle in for a nice snooze myself like the Edos. I checked the clock. It was 11. The next morning, I sat in my cage in the living room and watched the Edos in action. There was the usual morning commotion of people getting up, eating breakfast, listening to the news. Harry came into the living room to see me. Hi, Humphrey. Did you have a good sleep? Do you like my house? he asked. I was about to say yes, when Mrs. Edo rushed into the living room looking frantic. Harry, you've got to get dressed. The game is at nine, she said. It was only fifteen minutes before nine, and Mrs. Edo was still in her robe. What time's the game? Mr. Edo asked, wandering into the living room, still in his robe, too. Nine, Mrs. Edo told him. As she headed for the stairs, Mr. Edo was right behind her. Harry came back down in his soccer uniform at five minutes before nine. I crossed my toes and hoped that the soccer field was close to the house. Finally, Mr. and Mrs. Ito came back into the living room, both dressed. Where's Susie? Mr. Ito asked. Mrs. Ito ran back up the stairs. I'll get her dressed. Meet you in the car. Mr. Ito looked at the clock and shook his head. It was one minute before nine. Okay, he said, but we're going to be late. The last... Ito finally left the house at three minutes past nine. They were definitely late, as usual. I was exhausted from watching the family run around like that, but I realized that this was probably what went on in the Ito house every day that Harry was late to school. Mr. and Mrs. Ito were grown-up human beings and seemed quite smart. How could a small hamster help them change their ways? I thought about that problem all day between naps in my cage. Then I had an idea that began to take shape in my brain. The Edos weren't very good at keeping track of time, but when they did, they seemed to check that clock on the mantel. 
I couldn't change the Edos, but maybe I could change the clock they trusted so much. As I st stared at the clock, a long time, a little rhyme rolled around in my brain. Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. Susie had called me a mouse. At least I think that's what she meant by mouth. And hamsters are a lot like mice, according to Aldo, we're both rodents. So if a mouse could go up a clock, I guess a clever hamster could go up the clock. As long as I had a plan, I rested some more while the Edos were gone, knowing I had a busy night ahead of me. Once the family was back from the game, Harry's team won. Yay! I learned that the Edos were really fun as long as I didn't have to worry about time. Harry showed Susie some of his soccer moves in the backyard. Then they all went out for a while and came back with lots of yummy food. Later, Mr. and Mrs. Edo cooked a big dinner and Harry and Susie helped, and they gave me carrots. After dinner, they all went downstairs to the basement. Harry brought me along. I was glad he did because I got to sit in my cage and watch the family play table tennis. They didn't play table tennis with a table. They played it on a table using a small bounce using a small bouncy ball and paddles. Susie was too young to play, but they gave her a paddle and let her try. Harry and his parents were very good at hitting the ball back and forth across the table, with a little net going down the center. The game was quite exciting, and my net got tired from turning my head back and forth to follow the ball in its travels. Hey, maybe Humphrey would like to play, Harry said. I shivered and quivered a little bit worried that the Edos were going to bat me back and forth with paddles, but Harry had a better idea. First, he put blankets all around the edges of the table so I wouldn't roll off. Then he placed me inside of my hamster ball and set it on the table. Go for it, Humphrey, he said. The Edos all leaned in and watched as I rolled my ball across the table and toward the net. I was able to pick up quite a bit of speed. As I hit the net, I bounced off, just like the little white ball. Score, one for Humphrey, Harry said. Let's give him a point every time he bounces off the net. I don't mean to brag, but I scored ten points before Harry's mom said she was tired and needed to go to bed. She was tired? What about me? But I still had lots of work to do. Once I was alone in the living room and the house was completely quiet, I opened the lock that doesn't lock and slid down the leg of the coffee table. The moon shone through the big double doors, and I could see that there was a set of she metal shelves next to the fireplace. The shelves were spaced close together, which was a lucky break for me, because I could easily jump up and hop onto the mantel. I haven't had any experience with clocks, but I hoped that I could figure out how this one worked. It was an old-fashioned clock with numbers and hands. Not the kind with lighted numbers. The time was exactly 11.25. There was no way to set the time on the front of the clock. So I moved around to the back. There was a knob there, which I figured must be for setting the time. I reached up and tried to turn the knob to the right. The thing didn't budge. My plan wasn't going to work. I sat back down on the mantel and rested. Wait a minute. Humphrey, I squeaked softly to myself. You turned off Rock and A.K. Aki's. Rock and Aki, surely you can turn this little knob. I felt very determined as I leaped up and grabbed onto the top of the knob with all my might. I don't weigh much, but I hoped that if I could hang on long enough, I'd be heavy enough to move the knob. I shimmied my body over to the right and tried to yank the knob down. Oof, the knob budged a little bit. Ding, 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 ding. Suddenly the chimes rang out. I dropped back to the mantel. Ding, 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 ding. The chimes were so loud. It felt as if they were ringing in my brain. It was enough to give me a huge hamster headache. Still, I had a plan, and nothing was going to stop me. The ringing stopped, so I leaped up again, hung off for dear life, and moved the knob a little more. I let go. Then I scurried around to the front, checked the time, and returned to the back to move the knob again and again. My paws were aching. When I, went around, when I went around to check the front of the clock again, I saw that I had set the clock ahead five minutes. I was afraid to set it too far ahead, then the Edos might catch on, but maybe five minutes would make a difference. 
feeling unsqueakably pleased with myself, I looked for a way back to my cage. I thought of climbing down the wire sh the thought of climbing down the wire shelves made my stomach a little queasy. But on the other side, there was a window with curtains and a long cord hanging down. Perfect. I grabbed onto the cord and began to slide. Eek! I hadn't realized that this cord would be so slippery. I slid way, way, way faster than when I slide down the cord to the blinds in room 26. The room... The room was a blur as I zoomed down to the floor, which I hit a little harder than I would have liked. Once I recovered, I looked up at the clock. It was 11.45 by then. Of course, I knew that it was really only 11.40. I'm so glad I know how to tell time. I had another lucky break when I got back to the coffee table. There was a footstool next to it, and I climbed up easily and hopped back onto the table and into my cage. I was never so happy to crawl into my sleeping hut as I was that night. And to think at that moment, Og was alone in room 26, just swimming around in his tank. The next morning, I was a little sore, but anxious to see if all my hard work would pay off. It was a little later in the morning, when again there was a lot of running back and forth through the living room around 9.45. We'll be late to church, Mrs. Ito said, walking into the room in her robe. I'm all set, Mr. Ito answered. He strolled in, completely dressed for the day. You make sure the kids are ready, his wife said. I'll get dressed. Mr. Ito disappeared, and I could hear footsteps upstairs as the whole family hurried around. They finally reappeared in the living room again, dressed for church. Oh, no, we're going to be late again, Mrs. Ito said, looking at the clock. Only five minutes late, her husband said. Let's go. When they left, I looked up at the clock. It said it was five minutes to ten. But I knew it was really ten minutes to ten. The Edos would probably make it to church on time, barely. The rest of the day was quiet, quiet, quiet. I was dozing when Harry came and picked up my cage. Come on, Humphrey, he said. You can help me with my homework. Eek, I squeaked. I wasn't, I wasn't upset about the homework. I was upset because I didn't want to end up in Harry's room for the night. I already had a plan to give the Edos a little more help. Thank goodness when Harry was finished, he carried my cage back downstairs to the table in the living room. My plan was safe. When the house was quiet that night, after the clock chimed eleven, I opened the door to my cage, took a deep breath, and once again headed up the wire shelves to the mantel. With great effort, I turned the clock forward another five minutes. That would give the Edos an extra ten minutes in the morning. Hopefully the next morning I wouldn't be tardy and neither would Harry. Humphrey's rules of school, homework can be extremely tiring, especially if you're a classroom pet.